I'm very passionate about teaching people, especially teenagers and young adults, about how to manage money wisely. Now, of course, I don't have all the answers, but my, but my financial education and my personal and professional experiences regarding money management have taught me valuable lessons about how to build financial wealth and maintain it. And I've taken these lessons and I've organized them into 10 habits. 10 habits. And I strongly believe that if you apply these 10 habits to your life over a long period of time, then you will build financial wealth and maintain it. Now, of course, there are no guarantees, right? There are no guarantees. Of course, there are many things that can happen in life that are outside of our control, right? But in general, we reap what we sow. Holler if you hear me. Right? In general, we reap what we sow. And in general, if we sow good money habits, then we will reap financial wealth. Now, before we jump into these financial habits, though, I need to warn you about something. Always remember that money is not the most important thing in life. Holler if you hear me. Right? Money is not the most important. What profits a person to gain the whole world but forfeit their soul? Money is not the most important thing in life. Always remember this. Money is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. Holler if you hear me. Money is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. Always view money as your servant. Never view money as your master. Because if you, if you view money as your master, if you worship money, then money will become a curse in your life. Now think about that song that came out in the late 1990s, very popular song called more money, more problems. Very interesting concept, right? The chorus went something like, the more money we come across, the more problems we see. That concept is only true if you view money as your master. If you worship money, then yes, the more money you come across, the more problems you'll see. But if you view money as your servant, and if you learn how to make and manage money wisely, then money will become a blessing in your life. Never put your trust in money. In fact, never put your trust in anything that can be taken away from you. So now let's jump into these 10 habits, 10 habits to build financial wealth and maintain it. And as you'll see, these habits are more than just about how to manage money wisely. These habits are about how to manage your life wisely. Now, habit number one. Habit number one is find joy in work. Find joy in work. It's very important to choose a career that you truly enjoy, that you truly love. Because in any career, in order to really get to the top, you're going to have to go through obstacles. You're going to have to go through challenges. And one of the things that will help you to persevere through all the challenges is your enthusiasm. If you're enthusiastic about your career, that enthusiasm will help you to persevere and get to the top. Always remember this, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Holler if you hear me. Oh. Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. You have to be enthusiastic about the work that you do. Because think about it, success does not lead to happiness Happiness leads to success. Holler if you hear me. Yeah. If you really enjoy what you do, it's going to help you to become successful. You will never be successful in a career that you don't truly love. Now, you might earn money with it. It might be something that you're good at, right? You might have an image of success, but you will never be truly fulfilled. You'll never be truly successful in a career that you don't truly love. So choose a career that you really love. Now, of course, of course, as, as we are on the path to our dream career, right, there will be times in which we're gonna have to work jobs that we don't like, right? But even as we're working jobs that we don't like, we can view them as stepping stones to the job that we love. And even with the educational process, think about it. In every career field, in order to be the best, you're going to have to get additional training after high school, whether it's a traditional college university or whether it's some type of trade school or whatever, you know, some type of advanced training for every career field. 
And so as you go through that educational process, one of the things that will help you to enjoy that process, because even, even though you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult, very difficult at times, right? But one of the things that will help you to enjoy the process is to view it as stepping stones to your dream career. So find joy in work. It will help you to be successful, to do well, and to make money. Now here's the thing though, it's not enough, right? Because no matter how much money you make, if you don't manage the money well, you will go broke. Holler, can you hear me? Oh. For example, for example, in 1990, Willie Nelson, one of the most popular country music singers of all time, he went broke with debts of over 16 million. In 2003, the boxer Mike Tyson, who earned over 400 million during his boxing career, went broke with debts of 27 million. Here's the lesson. No matter how much money you earn, if you don't manage your money wisely, you will go broke. You see, money doesn't come with instructions. Have you noticed that? Money doesn't come with instructions. You must learn how to manage money wisely. You see, so how can we, because you must learn how to manage it or it will disappear. Money that is not managed wisely will disappear. Holler if you hear me. Yeah. Holler. So how can we manage our money wisely? Habit number two, <coughs> write a budget. It's very important to write out a budget. Every month, every month, before the month begins, you must write out a budget for that month. You have to write it out. You have to have a plan. You have to plan out how you expect to allocate money. There's three ways that you allocate money. Giving, saving, and spending. Giving, saving, and spending. And so before the month begins, you have to plan out how you expect to give money, save money, and spend money. See, when you write a plan on paper, it immediately becomes more clear and concise. If you fail to plan, then you are preparing to fail. Holler if you hear me. You see, it's very important, very important. As John C. Maxwell once said, a, a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. You have to have a plan. And as you go through the month, right? So before the month begins, before every month begins, you write out a plan, a budget. And then as you go through the month, you keep track of your actual allocations and you constantly compare your actual results with your budget. It'll help you to control and manage your money wisely. Now, I, I, I recommend something called a zero-based budget. <coughs> very easy, very easy to do. Here's what you do. At the, you take out a piece of paper, and at the top of the page, you put your total income for the month. Your total is the total amount that you expect to have coming in to you for that month, okay? So if you get paid um, every other week, then you're going to take both, you know, your, your, expected, your two expected paychecks, and you're going to add them together, and you're going to put that up top. Also, if you expect to receive any other uh, income, you're going to add that together, right? So you get your total income for the month, and then along the side, you're going to list out all the different categories in which you expect to allocate your money, all right? So I, I recommend that the first category be given, because I strongly recommend that the first thing you do with your income is you take a portion of it and give it away, right? Whether it's to a church as a tithe, right, or offering, right, or to uh, a, a charitable organization as a donation or to somebody that's in need of help, okay? But to give, have a habit of giving a portion of your income away to help somebody, right? So first category, giving. Second category, saving. You want to save a portion of your income. Every, every, with all of your income, you want to have a habit of saving, right? And there's many things to save for, right? Saving up to buy a car, saving up for college, saving up to invest in the stock market, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit later about how important that is to, in, to start investing early. Because you want to become, you, you want to get into a position where your money is making money for you. And so you want to start investing early, right? We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then the other categories are spending categories, right? Housing, utilities, food, clothing, transportation, insurance. Now, I understand not all these things relate to you right now, all right? But they will soon, right? You guys around 15, 16, 17 years old, 
very soon, think about it, very soon you're going to have to manage money. And so it's very important to be prepared because if you don't have a plan, you're going to fail. So this is a great plan. Now, here's the thing. Habit number three, spend less than you earn. Spend less than you earn. It sounds so very simple, right? But yet it's so very profound. Many people spend money that they don't have in order to buy things that, that they don't need. Don't be like that. See, there's a difference between your needs and your wants. Now, always take care of your needs, but delay your wants until you can really afford them, right? Delay your wants until you can really afford them. Don't go out on an, an expensive vacation until you can really afford to pay for it. Don't try to drive a Bentley on a Honda budget. Holler if you hear me, right? Don't try to drive a Bentley on a Honda budget. Habit number four, be grateful. Gratitude is so very important. You see, materialistic people waste money trying to buy happiness. You cannot buy happiness. You see, have you noticed that some people, when they get depressed, they go shopping because they think that by buying stuff, will make them happy. It never works in the long run. Never works in the long run. Because material things will never satisfy your soul because you will always want more. Being grateful for what you have will help you to avoid overspending. The best attitude is gratitude. Holler if you hear me. Oh. The best attitude is gratitude. Habit number five, stay away from credit cards. When people go into debt, they lose a portion of their freedom. Now, it's one thing to borrow money to buy a house, but it's another thing to take on financial obligations that you can't keep. And that's why credit cards are so very dangerous. Because credit cards, these credit card companies, they are trying to trap you. They're trying to trap you into going into debt and paying them interest. That's how they make money. You paying them interest. Now, there's other ways that they make money, right? Because also the merchants have to pay them a fee, you know, for their services, but they make a lot of money just off of you overspending and having to, to pay interest. Yeah? Wait, so if you're saying looking for cards, how would you build your Yeah, okay, now see that's one of the biggest things is that people think that you have to have a credit score. You have to have good credit, you have to have a credit score. But here's the thing, you don't have to have a credit score to do things like to buy a house you don't it's not necessary it's not totally necessary because there are a lot of mortgage companies that will do manual underwriting now i know it's not as as popular as common as your you know regular but there are mortgage companies that, that will do that all right um so there are ways to you know survive without a credit score yeah what were you thinking um oh okay i say about the mortgage okay yeah um do you have any credit cards Okay, well, I'm gonna get to this. This is my thing right here. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer that in a moment, right, right here, okay? All right, because there's one exception that I have, you know, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about that, this exception, okay? So here's the thing. Uh, well, here, I'm gonna jump to it right now while it's still fresh in your mind, okay? My only exception is this. If you plan to, use, number one, you plan to use it only for automatic routine payments, and you are 100% sure that you will pay it off in full each month. Now. The, and so if this holds true, if you can do this, then I think it's okay for you to use a credit card. The thing about it though is that most Americans can't do this. And so for most Americans, it's best for them not to use credit cards at all, right? But here's what I do. I've been able to do this where I have it set up where I don't, I don't go shopping with a credit card. But what I'll do, the only things I have on my credit card will be routine automatic payments, a cell phone bill, you know, where routinely, it's charged to um, uh, my credit card, right? It's the same, around the same amount each month, right? And I'm 100% sure that I'll pay it off in full each month. So it's not a lot, it's not a lot, okay? But here's what I'm saying though, is that if you can't do this, then you should just stay away from credit cards, right? Definitely, whatever you do, don't go to the mall with a credit card because you're going to overspend. A lot of people overspend. Use a debit card. A debit card does everything that the credit card can do, except get you into debt. Here's the thing, with a debit card, the money comes immediately out of your bank account. So you guard yourself against going into debt. So use cash or use a debit card rather than credit cards. Stay away from credit cards. 
Here's the thing. People spend a lot more money when using a credit card than they do when using cash. Do you know why? Because when you're using cash, when you're in the store and you actually see the cash leave your hand, that's more of an emotional experience. Holler if you hear me. Right? You have an emotional experience there. In fact, sometimes you might actually think to yourself, well, maybe I don't want that thing after all. Right? If you're using cash. If you're using credit, you're like, well, okay, it's okay. You know, you just, you know what I'm saying? It's so much easier to like use a credit card than it is to use cash to buy for something. So th this is why stay away from credit cards because credit cards put you in a position to overspend, right? And so unless you can, unless my only one exception, right? All right. So now here, here's another thing about um, credit cards and it's so very dangerous is because if you don't pay the minimum balance, I mean, no, 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 I'm sorry. If you don't pay it off in full, right, you have to pay the minimum balance, right? But if you don't pay it off in full, then they keep charging you interest and the interest will start to really add up, right? For example, suppose that you want to go on a vacation, like um, spring break comes up, right? And you want to go on a vacation, but you really don't have the money to afford to go on a vacation. A lot of people get into this situation, especially college students. Spring break comes, spring break comes, and they want to go with their friends on a vacation, but, but they don't have the money. So what do they do? They put it on a credit card, okay? Now, let's say it costs $5,000, all right? Some type of vacation, right? $5,000 total, right? They put it on a credit card. Credit card has an 18.9% interest rate, right? Which is very typical. And your minimum payment then is like $200 each month, right? Minimum pay, so you're, making the, you're paying the minimum payment, but it will take you 11 years and five months to pay the entire balance. By the time you make the last payment, you will have paid $8,109 for that $5,000 vacation. You see how the interest adds up? So you want to stay away from interest because you don't want to be trapped into paying interest. This is money that you could be using on other things. And think about it, you're working hard for your money. You don't want to be paying interest, all this interest. You know what I'm saying? 11 years, you know? It's amazing, it's amazing. Habit number six, save and invest. Before spending money on your wants, make sure that you've gotten out of debt, right? Because you don't want to be paying interest. Get out of debt and have saved up an emergency fund of at least three to six months of your living expenses. Why is that important to have an emergency fund, to have cash, in the bank, on hand, as your emergency fund, you know, why is that important to have an emergency fund? Yeah? Because what if you get fired, fired yep. and you can't find a job? That's right. That's right. That's right. Because yeah. if you get fired, sometimes it takes a while to get to, to get a second job, right? And so, yeah, you can get fired, you know, you, you can lose or just lose your job. Remember the government shutdown that happened, you know, sure. right? You know what I'm saying? So those government workers, they were out of work for a little while, right? They, 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 their income went down. And so you gotta have an emergency fund. Also, car repairs. Cars break down, you know? And you got so much stuff that happens. And so you gotta be prepared for it. Or even, even if, think about this, even if like a family member of yours, you know, has an emergency. You know what I'm saying? You want to be in a position. See, this is not about greed. It's about being able to manage your money well so that you can be a blessing for yourself and for your family, for your friends. You know? This whole thing about building financial wealth is so that you'll be that you'll be in a position where you can help others, you know? Because we all know people that go through financial struggles. You know? Now think about that. Think about if you manage your money well and that you have a friend that goes through some hard times and you're able to help that friend out. See what I'm saying? It's so very important to, to, you know, practice this stuff. So it's going to rain, so be prepared. Have a rainy day fund, a rainy day fund. Now, here's some steps. I want to give you just some detailed steps. They're general, but yet they're very specific. Step one is this. Save up an emergency fund of $1,000. That's like the first goal. $1,000. Save up that. All right? Step two, save up to pay off all debts you may have. Step three, save up to increase your emergency fund to be at least three to six months of your living expenses. Right? Step four, save up to prepare to pay for upcoming expenses in cash, like a car, college. You're right? 
Then, then think about this. Suppose you're 17 years old and you know that by the time you reach 20, you want to be able to buy a car in cash. Well, you can plan out ahead. You think to yourself, okay, three years from now, I want to be able to buy a car in cash. So you can plan out ahead and figure out how much money you need to save each month in order to be able to buy that car when you're 20 years old. You know what I'm saying? See, this is about strategy. It's about planning things out. It's about being organized. That's what it is. So, step four. Now, once you do the first four steps, then step five, save up to invest in stock mutual funds. Stock mutual funds. Mutual funds is the stock market, right? Mutual funds, though, are more, are, are safe, are more safe than individual stocks. Because individual stocks, when you invest in just one company, that's very risky, because that one company could go bankrupt. But if you invest in a mutual fund, a good mutual fund, you're investing in a large collection of companies. And so it's, it's safer. Now, of course, the stock market goes up and down, but when you look at it over the long term, it always goes up. It always goes up over the long term. I mean, when I say long term, I mean 30, 40 years, always goes up. And so even if you invest just $100 a month, $100 a month, over the long term, that one account can easily grow to become over a million dollars. Because the average interest that many mutual funds earn are around 12% over the long term. Average annual interest, 12%. And so, you know, with 12% and you think about 30, 40 years, it's amazing how fast your account grows because of the power of compound interest. Now, what is compound interest? Compound interest is where you're making interest not only on your original investment, but also you're making interest on the interest. So the interest is compounding. Now, to really make it clear, let me share with you this example, okay? Suppose we, you invest $100, okay, $100 invested at a 10% interest rate. We use 10% just to keep the numbers easy to understand. For the first year, how much interest do you earn? $10, right? Because you earn 10% of your investment of $100. Now, what happens to that $10? That $10 gets reinvested into the account. So at the beginning of the second year, how much money do you have in your account? You have... $110, right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I'm talking about at, at the beginning, all right? At the, okay. So then, therefore, for year two, how much interest do you earn? $11, right, $11, right? Excellent, because what happened? You earn interest on the original 100, but also you earn interest on the $10 that you had earned previously, right? So you see how the interest is starting to compound. So now, for the, at the beginning of the third year, how much money do you have? You have $121. And so for the third year, how much interest do you earn? $12.10, right? So you see how you're earning interest on the original $100, but also you're earning interest on the interest that is being reinvested into the account. And therefore, the interest is compounding. That's what they mean by compound interest. The interest is compounding. Now, this is going to really blow your mind, this chart that you're going to see here. Check this out. We have two guys, Ben and Arthur. Ben starts investing into a mutual fund, right? Average mutual fund make, make over, you know, long term, 12% interest. He starts investing $2,000 a year, starting at age 19. And he goes through 26 and he stops. After, after age 26, he stops. Arthur, he starts investing later on. He starts investing at age 27, and he continues investing $2,000 every year and through age 65. So now, Ben, how much money did Ben totally invest? He invested only $16,000, $2,000 a year for eight years. How much money did Arthur totally invest? He invested $2,000 uh, a year for 39 years, so he invested a total of $78,000. Now, when both of them turn 65, you would think Arthur would have more money in, in his mutual fund account because he invested more money than Ben, right? You would think, right? He invested $78,000. Ben only invested $16,000. But when you look at the numbers, Ben actually has $2.2 million. Arthur only has $1.5 million. Ben has $700,000 more than Arthur. How can that be? B, 
Ben only invested sixteen thousand. Arthur invested seventy-eight thousand. It's the same account, but how is it that Ben came out with more money? Any ideas? No, no, no. Same account, same mutual fund, same average mutual fund, same twelve percent interest. Yes. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah. yeah. He invested earlier. You see that? Look. He, because both of them were the same age. Ben started investing at, at the age of 19. Arthur waited until he was 27. But by the time both of them reached 65, Ben had more money because Ben had more time for his interest to compound. Yeah? Um, I don't really understand. Like, what is investing? Well, okay, no, no, I mean, that, that, that's a broad term, okay? Like, now, investing in the stock market, yeah. investing in the stock market, you're investing in shares of ownership of a company, right? So, now, when you invest, when we invest in, like, for example, you can go out and you can buy a share of, of, of McDonald's stock, right? Now, here's the thing. McDonald's has so much stock, right? And so when you buy a share of McDonald's stock, you become, really technically, you become a part owner of McDonald's. But here's the thing, your percentage is so, your percentage of ownership is so so small that you can't make any decisions or anything, right, for the company, right? And so, but the thing is that as McDonald's makes money, then they will give you dividends, you know, and you can set it up where your dividends will be automatically reinvested into the account. Also, too, the stock prices, the stock price of McDonald's goes, you know, up and down, just like any company, right? And so, you know, if you buy McDonald's, like for example, I was tutoring a kid, he's like maybe 20 now, when he was um, like two or three, his grandparents gave him McDonald's stock. And now, you know, just as, as a gift, his grandparents gave him. And now, I mean, it's worth, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a, a lot, a lot amount. It's, it's a huge amount right now, you know? And he still has the investment, you know? And so it's amazing how, and see, here's what happens. McDonald's stock though, right? The company stock, over time, it really goes up, right? Hopefully, right? Unless they go bankrupt, right? But anyway, so you have McDonald's stock, right? And you say you bought it at $5 per share, and then let's say you sell it at $10 per share, then you've earned the difference, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Can you get out of the stock anytime you want? Okay, well, I mean, technically you can, but here's the thing, if you get out of it, you have to get out of it at the price that it, that it is currently. You know what I'm saying? So for example, suppose you buy McDonald's stock at, I don't know what, but let's say you buy it at $200 per share, but then next week it drops to $170 per share and you want to get out of it, well, you're not going to get your $200 back. You're going to have to settle for $170, you know what I'm saying? So you can get out of it any time, but you might lose money. And so this brings up a good point. When, talk, when investing in the stock market, do not invest money that you're going to need within the next five years, you know? Or even, maybe even 10 years, you know what I'm saying? Because, okay, what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about 12% interest, when you look at this stuff, these guys were investing for the long term, okay? The stuff about this, when you hear about stock market being very risky, it's risky if you're trying to invest for the short term. Because yes, I mean, think, think about it. A couple years ago, stock market went way down, but now it's coming back up again, right? So here's the thing. Do not invest money that you're going to need in the short term. Invest money that, that you can let stay in there for the long term. Because over the long term, it always goes up. Yeah? So. All right, so here's the thing. So did, did, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah okay, all right. Side note about car loans, about car loans. In the United States, the average car loan payment is $482 per month. Now think about this. Think about if you say to yourself, you know what? When I buy a car, I don't wanna have to borrow money to buy the car. I wanna be able to buy the car in cash. Now suppose you save up, you manage your money well, you save up to buy the car in cash. And so instead of doing what a lot of Americans do by getting a car loan, you, you have a paid for car, and so rather than paying like $482 per month, which is the average, around average, you take that $482, which you would have been paying the car company for the loan, but you take that amount and you invest it into a good growth stock mutual fund, then if you invest that, if you get, get into the habit of doing that from age 18 to 65, you would have around $5.2 million at the age 65. And think about it, 65 is young. Now, of course, to a 15 year old, 65 seems so very old, right? Right? Some of you might even have grandparents that are younger than 65, right? But here's the thing is that 65 is young, and you think about it, people are living much longer these days. So here's what I'm saying. You want to plan your life out well, you want to make good decisions so that 
you know, there's a saying, you want to do things so that your future self will thank your present day self. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people that are in their 60s, they look at information like this and they say, I wish somebody would have told me this information when I was a teenager. That's, that's what they say a lot. A lot of people say that. I wish someone would have told me that when I was a teenager. And you know what is the exciting thing for me coming here and sharing with you this stuff? Because I really do think that I do really do think that some of you are really going to do this stuff and are going to really become wealthy. And I just imagine that 40 years from now, you, some of you are going to be very wealthy, and you're going to think back and you say, you know what? There was this guy that came to my school when I was in high school, and he told me about this financial stuff. And because of him, he got me thinking on the right way. And because of him, I'm now very successful. I don't even remember his name. I just remember he used to dance and stuff. I don't remember his name. But, and, and I just, you know what I'm saying? That's what I think about. And I think about that's such an amazing thing that can happen. Because I really do think, I think that there's so much hope for you if you make the right, have the right habits, right? So now, side note about student loans. That's a big thing. A lot of people borrow money to go to school, right? Now, here's some tips on how to get through school with no student loans, or at least with a minimum amount of student loans. Apply for scholarships. Two, choose a college you can afford. Three, consider a community college for the first two years, right? And then transfer to a university. You know, it depends on your situation, right? Number four, have a part-time job while in college, right? It all helps. In fact, having a part-time job, research studies have shown that college students who work while they're in college have a higher GPA than those who do not work, right? And you know, and it makes sense. It makes sense, you know why? Because when you're busy, you have better, you, you're more disciplined and you have more time management skills, right? And so the time that you do study is more productive than you know, those that have a lot of time on their hands. Because you know how it is. When, you, when we have a lot of time on our hands, we tend to waste time. Holler, can you hear me? Aww. Right? So it's good. It's good. So, you know, so these are some, some tips. Hobby number seven is give. Give. Very important to give. And when I say give, I mean give with a sincere heart of gratitude and compassion. Right? Because when you give, you confirm to yourself that you have more than enough. You confirm to yourself that you have an abundance. And that sense of abundance puts you in a position to receive even more success. It's amazing how the gift of giving is better than a gift received. The secret to living is giving. So live with your hands open. Because if you hold money with a clenched fist, although you are preventing money from going out, you also are preventing even more money from coming in. So live with your hands open. Give. Now, of course, of course, be smart about it, right? Don't allow people to abuse your kindness. But at the same time, always be generous. Because the only people who really prosper in life are those who are generous and honest. Generous and honest. Be generous and honest. So give. And you know, this concept of giving relates to all areas of our life, including our relationships. You know, I think about, remember yesterday I was telling you about the girl that that uh, you know rejected me and I was very depressed and all that. And I think about that, and when I was in high school, I tried to chase after love. And I, I realized something. If you try to chase after love, love will always elude you. But if you become love, love will always surround you. Holler if you hear me. Right? It's so true. It's so true. You know, in fact, I remember, I think about that, I think about how when I was in high school, there was this guy from my neighborhood named Danny. Danny was one of the most popular kids in school. And he was friends with everyone, including the girl that I had a crush on. And so I asked him to call her on three-way with me, but not to tell her that I'm on the phone. And, and I listened in as, you know, and I know it was very immature. It was very immature, very immature. But I was a very immature teenager, right? So anyway, so I'm listening in as they're talking. And Danny asked her, so what do you think about Lance? And I'll never forget when she said, ew. He's weird and ugly. And I allowed those words to depress me. I allowed those words to cause me to have low self-esteem. Now, here's what interesting happened. Year, a couple years later, I'm in college, and I'm working a part-time job at the Disability Support Center on campus. And my job was to assist college students who had physical disabilities. One of the students I assisted was a blind girl Right? She was blind, also she had um, some, like, some learning issues. And 
as I got to know her, I began to realize that she had a very lonely life, right? A lot of people looked down on her, and she had a very lonely life. And I was very compassionate towards her because I know what it's like to be lonely. I know what it's like to have people look down on me, right? And so I was very compassionate towards her. I was very friendly towards her. And I remember it was November and Thanksgiving was coming up. And I invited her to attend my family's annual Thanksgiving dinner at my grandmother's home, right? Because I, 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 I learned that she didn't have a place to go for Thanksgiving. Now, honestly, I hesitated when I was thinking about making the decision to invite her because I wasn't sure if I really wanted to associate myself socially with her, right, because of her issues. But then I reminded myself of the golden rule, right? The golden rule. Treat others the way that you like to be treated. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. The golden rule. I reminded myself of the golden rule. Also, I reminded myself of the fact that I do not want to be snobby, you know? I mean, think about it. Snobby people reject people who have issues. Snobby people reject people who have a low social status, right? Snobby people only want to hang out with people who are cool, right? I don't want to be snobby. Now, of course, of course, we all, we all should always stay away from people who have a negative influence on us. Holler if you hear me, right? Uh. Okay? But those are the only people that we should stay away from, right? Unless a person has a negative influence on us, we should always embrace them, all right? And so with that attitude, I reached out and I invited her to my family's annual Thanksgiving dinner. She came, she had a great time, she felt loved by my family. And at the end of the night, when I was dropping her off at home, she turned to me and she said something to me that I will never forget. She said, Lance, you are so beautiful. And those words really shocked me because no one had ever called me beautiful before. In fact, I was still holding on to those words from that girl back in high school who called me weird and ugly. And you know, that was such a profound experience. Think about it. Think about how profound that was, though. This blind girl calling me beautiful, it showed me that true beauty is something that cannot be seen with physical eyes. True beauty is something that can be seen only through the eyes of the soul. And we are beautiful whenever we do beautiful things. Holler if you hear me. Yeah. Right? Whenever we do beautiful things, we're beautiful. Whenever we love, whenever we, we give, whenever we're nice to people, whenever we try to uplift people, whenever we try to reach out to people who are hurting, whenever we do beautiful things, we are beautiful. Beauty is what beauty does. Holler if you hear me. Yeah. Beauty is what beauty does. And so that experience... That experience really, really got me to understand that the gift of giving is better than a gift received. And that the secret to living is giving. To really make this point clear, let me share with you this song. Check out this song. <laughs> Check out this song. <laughs> yes, I mean, you want to be more than a star. You want to be a star maker. <laughs> in the end we'll ask the question did we live and if we ever love and if our presence was a blessing or wasn't enough that's why my biggest dream is to answer all the above by motivating others to never give up so 40 years from now the success will be so profound looking back you see why I'm up on the stage now it's not about myself I'm not doing this for the praise I'm giving back the gift that inspired me to be brave the money's gonna come if you stay true to the vision you always give back what you keep giving. Holler if you hear me. Yes, yes. Excellent. Yes, yes. So yes, you always get back. You always get back what you keep giving. So give, give. So, habit number eight. Be ethical. Be ethical. Ill-gotten gain will not last. Will not last. Listen, in our lives, we all, we all experience temptation. And as long as we live, we will always continue to experience temptation. Temptation to cheat, temptation to lie, temptation to steal, temptation to do things that are against our values. We all experience temptation on a routine basis. Holler if you hear me. Uh, right? We all experience temptation. So please, though, remember this. Always do your best to do the right thing. Because ill-gotten gain will not last. People with integrity walk safely, but those who follow crooked paths will slip and fall, all right? 
So we got a few more minutes left. Let me try to get through this. Habit number nine, be humble. Here, oh, this humility is a very big thing. Because think about it. The moment you start developing an ego is the moment when everything starts to fall apart. Holler if you hear me. Yeah. Right? Be humble. Be humble. No matter how, but I really do believe that you guys are going to be very wealthy if you practice this stuff. But look, be humble. Never start to think that you're better than somebody else just because of money, you know? Be humble because it can all fall apart so quickly, so quickly. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Always be humble. And the last one, habit 10, be courageous. Be courageous. Don't be afraid to fail. If you live for people's acceptance, you'll die by their rejection. Be courageous. Always be open to criticism, but never let it defeat you. Never let yourself to become a prisoner of other people's opinions. All right? All right. So now, on your feedback piece of paper, on your feedback piece of paper, um, okay, well, real quick, on your notes piece of paper, please write down DaveRamsey.com. DaveRamsey.com. This is, Dave Ramsey is a guy uh, where I've learned a lot of these money management skills from. So you want to check out his website. It's very, very good stuff. So feedback. Okay, we only have like 30 seconds. Please just respond to this one question. Was this presentation useful to you? Was this presentation useful to you? And please explain your answer.